Hi everyone, let me introduce myself to those who do not know me. I am Ashnat Kothari, a qualified fellow actually. I am the founder and director of Fanatics. Fanatics is involved in providing classes for actual exams, placement assistance, along with plenty of other services which a student needs at different phases in their journey to become a qualified fellow actually. I have been professionally teaching actual science for the past eight years having mentored students not only from all parts of India but from across the globe. Now coming back to the much awaited announcement, the reason why you are here, we are extending an opportunity for students who have not studied with us to join our classes, get mentored by us for the preparation of actual exams by paying zero tuition fees at outset. Yes, you heard it right, zero tuition fees at outset. This is valid for classes of CM1, CM2, CS1 and CS2 whether you are appearing from IFOA or IAI. Ones who would be joining us for the first time can see how we go about with our classes, the educational content we provide, the doubt clearing facility we provide, the sort of guidance, unbiased guidance we provide and after spending some time, if you find value in the educational content and guidance we provide, you can pay the full fees. Now you might be wondering as to why we are coming up with this opportunity even though Fanatics is at its peak with respect to the performance of its students in actual exams as well as their professional career. The reason is simple. You will not see us extensively marketing over social media be it through Insta Reels, YouTube Shorts or other various ways. You will not see us coming up with new batches on a regular basis or flexing the number of students we have and outrightly ignoring the proportion of students who cleared the exams or who even continue with their journey. Being in the education industry, we make a conscious effort to channelize majority, if not all, of our energy and time towards ensuring that students are having a proper learning journey not just spoon feeding them everything so that they might get certain favorable results in the short term but by ensuring to make them independent, capable of working independently even in our absence and therefore succeeding both in their personal and professional journey in the long run. Do note that we we'll continue to have one single batch for each paper each term to ensure that all our students are getting sufficient time from the faculty do keep in mind that at Fanatics, it is the main faculty, be it Gunjan or me, who are involved in taking the classes, doubt clearing or any sort of guidance or any sort of assistance which the students require in the preparation of their actual exams. As such, we will restrict the number of intakes to 50, 50 for each of the papers. In case you are already studying from us and you are happy with the way we go about with our classes, continue to study from us. For ones who have not studied from us but who are looking forward, this is the best chance for you all to join us, experience how we go about with our classes. If you are a sincere and hardworking student who wants to excel in your actual career, do join Fanatics today for a meaningful, impactful and wonderful learning experience. Hi everyone. So in this video, we shall be discussing the indicative solution for IFOA April 2024 CS2A paper. So um, to begin with, uh, regarding, you know, how I found the difficulty of the paper, I thought this paper was relatively easier compared to the previous terms. Again, there were a couple of questions which could have four challenges. I mean, there were certain questions which posed different challenges, but in terms of the ability of solving it, Maybe not within examination time, but just the way the questions were there. I would say definitely, you know, this was um, relatively easier, at least compared to the immediate past term. Um, CS2 paper B also, uh, as per interaction with a couple of students, they did mention that they found one or two parts tricky or, you know, they were short on time. So overall, I feel the pass marks should be roughly in the range of 56, you know, plus minus a couple of marks. And yeah, so that's my view regarding the paper.
also i haven't really got a chance to review my solutions uh, given the shortage of time so in case you find any sort of calculation errors or you feel that the way a question has been done is wrong uh, feel free to let us know through the comments section we'll definitely take a look into it and in case we find any merit we would be pushing in the rectifications through the comments section itself so the way to go around watching this video is key you are taking a look at the comments section we would be pinning a comment which would have corrections if any and in case you do find the video useful and definitely you know, do like it or do drop in a comment as well and make sure to subscribe to our channel so that you are updated with all the latest educational content which we share before we get started with the paper just one more thing uh, we are starting with our new batches for the IFOA September 2024 term and IEI November 2024 term from 5th of May uh, new batches uh, live batches are starting for all the papers so that information I had to share. Now coming back to the paper, so um, I, I will come into you know point by points as well uh, to each question. There were some reports or you know rather some students had concerns that maybe a particular question was out of syllabus. It had ruined theory, which is there in CM two. So we'll take into uh, we'll take a look into all of this and we'll see you know whether there is any merit or not uh, on that. So starting with the first question, a rather straightforward question, but it might have taken uh, some time for computation purpose. A couple of students I interacted with did mention they ended up spending a lot of time on this question. It's a 11 mark question. Ideally should not be devoting more than let's say 20, 22 minutes, but a couple of students did ended up spending a lot of time. So over here, X is nothing but a log normal distribution with parameters 2.6 and 3 square. And then uh, part two had to be computed. Now it's written calculate and it's 10 marks. So you might think uh, whether, you know, you should be deriving the result for the truncated moments of log normal or not, because it was 10 marks, you and I thought so. But because the question does not see derive, you might just use the results given in the actual tables and go ahead and solve it. So this is why I'm working in terms of X only. So there's an inflation of 20%. So basically it pays 1.2 X minus 2000 when 1.2 X is greater than or equal to 2000. And then I compute its expectation. I split the integrals. So on solving, this is what I'm getting. 1227.33. So this was rather a straightforward question. Uh, most of you were able to solve it. Yeah, some of you made some errors with the limits, taking it as 2000 and not 2000 divided by 1.2. Next question number two, again, rather a direct one over here. So part one is calculating the values of alpha, beta and delta by considering the graduated rates at age 70 and 71. So there are four possible values, female 70, female 71, male 70, male 71. You could take any three of them. I took female 70, female 71 and male 70. In case of taking male 71 instead of something else, you might possibly get a different answer. I haven't got the time to re uh, review it. But yeah, point is key. Whichever we use, it would be correct. You could take any of these three values. Uh, coming to the solution part. So log of 0.14227 is this, this, these are the three equations, you know, subtract the first two equations, you get the value of beta. You might substitute the value of beta in part three, and then, you know, you might go about subtracting part three and part two. And from there, you will get the value of delta. And then you can substitute that value in any of the equations and you should be getting the value of alpha as well. So these are the values which I'm getting for question number two. Then part three is performing a chi-square test. So you have the observed deaths, you have the graduated rates, multiplying graduated rates with exposed to this will give you the expected one. I have not solved this explicitly. It's rather straightforward. So you'll get the expected ones and then you can get O minus E whole square divided by E. Moving forward to the next question, question three, again, uh, I will be honest. Uh, uh, questions on time series sometimes might take a lot of time when it comes to typing on word. So this question, although very direct in nature, but part three involved computation of the determinant of a three cross three matrix, which would have definitely taken some time, especially if you're directly solving it on word. I tend to solve everything on paper. And I think for some questions, specifically for CS2 and maybe sometimes for CM2 also, it just becomes, I feel easier if I just solve it on paper and then I just type it out. But again, this is because I might have a relatively higher accuracy on paper and my time would be quick. But yeah, point is for some of you, 
it might be you know the quicker thing and that's why i mentioned to you try all these things out to see you know what works for you what might work for an individual a might be different for individual b so do not rely on what others say try it for yourself and see what's best for you and that is how you should be going ahead so question number 3 this is part 1 this is part 2 again in case you find any sort of calculation mistakes definitely let us know part 3 we need to find the pacf at lag 1 2 3 4 5 it's an er3 process so one and two the formulas of this is directly given in actual tables you can use it to compute the values 5 4 and 5 5 would be zero it's a property of arp that pacf cuts off when k is greater than p And five three is determined p three star by determined p three. This is p three. You get p three star again. The uh this formula for p k is given there in the actual tables itself, and then you can go out computing its determinant. So what I'm getting ultimately it's uh five three is minus two forty two by nine forty five. So definitely, you know, this would have taken some time, especially for doing one word visualizing things might become a challenge. So this is where you need to be a bit conscious regarding what's the best way to approach a question, how to go it, what are the adequate number of steps you need to be putting in the examination, and so on. Next is question four. So yes, this is those questions which some of the students were raising. That this has ruined theory concept. It should be in CM two. It's not a part of syllabus, and so on. Now my view on this is, ah uh, yes, they have mentioned ruin. Technically, ah uh, this topic is explicitly covered in CM two. but uh, we do not need any new knowledge as such i mean if you would have used a common business sense or insurance sense with respect to you know or the literal meaning of ruin and when would an insurer get ruined you would have been able to solve the question there was no fundamental concept which you do not know by virtue of studying for of cs2 if you know reinsurance if you know risk model you should have been in a position to solve this question So question number four, I define A T is the surplus at time T. So at time one, the insurer starts with an initial capital. It receives premium and needs to pay claim amount. So the total surplus it has is U plus C T minus S T. Now this is something you could have derived, not derived. You could have you know understood uh, or started with. And obviously, I mean, if you couldn't, then it would have, might have been a challenge. But yeah, once you get this, thereafter you will see there's nothing. Uh, Different uh, than what you have studied in CS two, which is required to solve. So I have now replaced T with one over here. I have computed expectation S one, variance of S one, and the annual premium. And what I am looking for is probability A one less than zero zero point zero five, which transforms over here. Then I am standardizing this, and on equating, I am getting U as twelve thousand eight seventy five to the nearest pound. After reinsurance, I find in the expected value, the variance, the reinsurer premium, the insurer's net premium, and again I compute this probability. Now over here, I need to find the maximum value of the loading charge by the reinsurer. So I I put in U as nothing but uh, the previous value, and on getting that, getting beta as thirteen point four three percent. So again, ah, uh, uh, it took me I guess around. One hour forty five minutes to solve this paper, leaving one question. I'll come to it. Uh, Copula's part three. I had to spend some time just to you know verify whether what I'm doing is correct or not. Uh, apart from that, yeah, I mean, leaving that one three marks question, all of them was done. Again, I have not done comments and all, so take it with a pinch of salt. It's not that if I was sitting for the examination, I would have been able to do it, and I'm doing it on paper. So I just mentioned this time so that you can just take a relative one. Ki the previous time I mentioned around let's say. Two hours. This time I'm saying one hour forty five minutes means this time of paper was rather little bit maybe shorter compared to last one. But again, you need to keep into account the proportion of numericals, comment based question because I tend to skip the comments and all or theory ones over here. So again, that should not be taken as an estimate that you will need to complete the exam in that time. It's just for relative purpose when comparing different papers. Next question number five, which was from Markov chain. This was a rather straightforward question, and I expect uh, students to you know perform pretty well in this. So, taking a look at question number five, part three, I rather felt. I mean, ah, uh, it's given. It's of four marks. It just felt uh, the amount of work needed was not ah uh, in line with that. Um. So yeah, it's twenty five percent. Next, moving forward to question six. This again. Uh, I guess students did find challenge not in part one, 
बट डेफिनेटली इन पार्ट टू एंड थ्री पार्ट थ्री इवन आई वॉज नॉट श्योर वेन आई सो इट की हाउ वॉट्स द बेस्ट वे टू गो अबाउट इट बिकॉज समथिंग लाइक दैट इट्स नॉट डेर इन द मटीरियल आई ट्राई टू गूगल आउट आई डेंट गेट एनीथिंग बट देन आई ट्राई टू अप्लाई समथिंग गॉट एन आंसर देन आई यूज द हेल्प ऑफ आर्ट सॉफ्टवेयर एंड आई गॉट द प्रोबेबिलिटी फ्रॉम देर इट वॉज टर्निंग सो आई मीन या सो अगेन सिक्स पार्ट थ्री आई डेफिनेटली क्यों इट इज समथिंग विच अ लॉट ऑफ यू माइंड फाइंड अ बिट न्यू so we have x and y these are two independent uh, not two independent other x and y are random variables n 0 comma 1 and we are using a gumbel copula with a parameter value equal to 1.5 so this is 6 this is u and v this is the formula for c u comma v and on computing this i'm getting this as 0.002239 part 2 again it's in this form greater than first i'll convert it into less form so it's 1 minus u minus v plus c u comma v Over here, u is probability x less than one point six four, v is y less than two point three three, and uh, you will compute c u comma v by substituting these values in this equation, and your final answer is coming out as point double zero seven one eight four. Now part three, this can be written as probability mod x less than one point six four, probability mod y less than two point three three. Now x and y has this uh, relation of Gumbel copula one point five, so mod x and mod y can also be treated to have that relation. So this is u, this is v, and if we substitute the values, you'll be getting this answer as point eight nine three double eight one. Now, uh, I did not, I wasn't aware. Uh, I'm still yet to figure out completely statistically speaking, that if x and y have a gumbel, are you know using a gumbel copula with parameter one point five, how can we say that mod x and mod y will also be following that? Although see, x and y are following normal distribution, so mod x and mod y also follow kind of transform normal distribution itself. But yeah, I am still yet to figure out if there is a property or not which states this. But clearly, the answer was telling when I am computing this using R. So this is what I find to be correct. But yeah, in case I later get some alternative thing, I will definitely uh you know update that in the comments section. Next was question seven, and I would say again, you know, it's I I feel uh sometimes bad for you all that you are forced to you know set exams in Word. I just feel it's a useless. uh ability of you know knowing how to do mathematical typing does not really add much value but we students you know who are sitting for exams they do end up spending a lot of time in practicing that but yeah, that is how it is uh you no know, point uh you know seeing whether that's right or wrong i mean that is how it is ultimately for sitting for exams you'll have to deal with it but it's definitely a skill which i don't really find much value in the ability to do mathematical typing as an actuary So part one again, it was something straightforward, doable. Part two, I mean, it would have been a pain trying to do it over Word directly. When I was also solving this, so of all the entire paper, part two took the most of the time. I was trying to do some things mentally, you know, just try to see how I can, you know, demonstrate because it's k greater than equal to one. So I just can't do it for k equal to one, two, three, four, five. I'm like, I need to prove it, so I need to take a general expression. So initially I was stuck. I took k as one, then I took k as two. Then I'm like, what to do? What to do? And finally, when I took k equal to three, I realized, okay, no, a pattern is coming. So it's not that tedious. But again, it took me maybe a half an hour, I guess, or around twenty five minutes or so to you know solve this question because I was just resistant to write the next step because it looked like no, this methodology might not give me the general result. So this is question seven. This is part one. X T E T. We are using certain properties like past value, future error are independent of all error terms are independent of each other. Then part two, when I'm taking k equal to one, I'm computing it. I'm getting sigma to the power. I'm getting this term a plus b whole into sigma square plus sigma to the power four, which is telling. Then I'm taking k as two, and I'm getting this term. So similarly, expectation x t t minus k will be alpha to the power k minus one into this term. And part three, you will see that for this model we have a plus b k into a to the power k. For the other one, which is a AR one process, rho k is nothing but alpha to the power k. So you will clearly see that this will decrease exponentially towards zero. Whether the first model it will move slightly, slowly towards zero, and it could happen depending on the value of alpha and a plus b. It's given that both a and b are positive, so clearly rho k will be greater than uh, this one for each different value of k. uh unless you know your a plus b is less than 1 in which case this might be lower so it needs to see what the values of a and b or what the value of k is 
point is this would usually decay a bit more slower as compared to alpha to the power k as k you know keeps on increasing so this term decreases but this term keeps on increasing over here as k increases this term keeps on decreasing so this was one thing and then a slight more points as well you could you know add to it next coming to question eight uh now again this one uh part three i'll be honest it was deriving the transition matrix of the corresponding markov jump chain my issue was whether they are just asking us the transition matrix for the Markov jump chain or they are asking us the transition matrix for the Markov jump. Because it's given six marks, it did not make sense if they're just asking for Markov jump chain because that is straightforward mu ij by lambda i. Then I thought, ki, okay, no, it's written derived. So maybe they want us to derive this result mu ij by lambda i. And yes, this is there in the material. If you'll take a look at the chapter Markov jump time homogeneous process, in a, one of the pages, uh, probably the header might be occupancy probability. I don't remember exactly, but I did go to the material. This derivation is there. So far, I don't know any student who has done this. So you can definitely take a look at the material. It was there. Part one, I mean, just need to add each of the rows. It must be zero. It was straightforward. Part two, some of them found it difficult to interpret the question. My interpretation is we're just looking for the probability that a person leaves the state two between time zero to 0 0.5. So another way to look at it is we'll find the probability that the person continuously remains in state two till time 0 0.5. And we subtract from one to get the probability, which will give, will be giving us the probability that a person rather in fact has left state two between time zero to 0 0.5. So this was part one. This is part two. Again, you need to derive this. I have not derived the result of P I I bar T. You need to derive it. This is the result part three. This is the final values, which is nothing but mu IJ by lambda I. So um, my idea is key around three marks or so would be for the final answer of part three and another three marks, excuse me, could be for the derivation. So overall, I thought this paper again, uh, as I've maintained the stands for CS2, it will test you. You are expected to read things from material. You are expected to apply more importantly, are expected to score as much as you can for the questions, you know, because they'll you ask you something or the other, which is going to test a small thing, which might not have really come previously. Like over here also for time series, this model is a slightly different one where you have this uh, multiplication of XT minus one, ET minus one as well. Maybe this type of model is there in the material. I do not recall exactly, but if I remember correctly, there was this model, uh, I don't remember the name, where there was a multiplication of XT minus one, ET minus one. So again, point is it's a new model and you need to use your statistical concepts to you know, kind of derive it using first principles itself. So for a lot of you, especially ones who have just, let's say, studied CM1 and CS1, more specifically CM1, a lot of you, maybe by your own choice or maybe what guidance you might be getting from your seniors or others, I don't know. You all think that you can game the paper and that is possible in CM1. You just take a look at material, you solve faster questions and you know, a significant proportion of the questions given in the exam are in that form. So you feel that something same would be given, you just need to practice and get it. But clearly that is not how the actual course is. Certainly CS2 paper is not like that. And certainly life or job won't be like that where you will be expected to do the same thing again and again what I've previously done. Ultimately, if you want to borrow, if you want to get a paid a hell lot of money or achieve a particular position, you'll need to add some value. And clearly doing something which is already being done similarly, that will not add materially any value. So you need to fundamentally change your mindset. Uh, in CM1, the spoon feeding completely works. You may, might go, somebody might tell you how to solve all the questions in the class. You might do it. You might solve the paper. You might secure a R1. You might score a 1995 and you might feel happy. But yeah, I mean, come CS2 and then you'll be like, what is this happening? Why are they giving questions which are not there? How can they ask us? That is how exams are supposed to be in my understanding. It means it should be testing your ability to apply. At least that's how the actual science course is. And that is how, you know, most of us actually would want it. If anyone who wants to grow, wants to add value, wants to earn a lot of money, you need to be, you know, uh, doing stuff which others find it difficult to do, or you need to be applying to solve the challenges. It's not about replicating same thing in and out again. So you need to fundamentally modify the way you prepare for CS2 and not get fixated by the way you might have prepared for CM1. It might work wonders in terms of getting marks, getting AR1, but clearly that is not the best way to prepare. And it's something you're going to really struggle, be it for higher papers. When things become a lot more subjective, there is no objectivity. 
lot of idea generation is there you need to connect a lot of things you need to speak for something against something and give a very holistic answer and specifically for cs2 and even somewhat maybe at times for cm2 you need to apply using the fundamental concepts so you need to read the material i keep on suggesting to my students as well even though if you find my notes amazing and if you feel that it's pretty exhaustive honestly it is not it might cover maybe 98% or 99% of the content which has been tested so far but clearly the material is there for a reason it is very painful for some chapters to go through it i will agree with you all i have also faced that challenge but then you should be doing it especially if you are starting early you know studying on a timely basis you should be putting in that time else you will might you know just defer cs2 a lot of you all are just deferring cs2 thinking it's a difficult paper we'll clear other papers just uh, give me, let me give a reality check it's just going to get a lot more difficult for you once you start working because you won't get much time to practice and there are so many of seniors who are done with most of the papers just left with cs2 and the biggest challenge for them is devoting the time higher papers you might just read once you might have a good understanding and you might clear the paper with minimal effort relatively speaking but these papers like cs2 cm2 they are a bit more technical you need to devote a certain amount of time to practice and you need some sort of regularity because to maybe sometimes solve one question it might take you 2 hours and if you can just put in 2 hours in a day only because obviously you are working as well so then that continuity does not come so don't unnecessarily defer cs2 examination for later on while the time you are not working or if you are in college you know try to study for it clear it i mean at least study it clear is the next part do study it do attempt the paper don't unnecessarily defer it it's just going to be a bit more painful you're just deferring it for a later and uh, today you might be happy but the future you might not be happy you know with your decision today so change the way you go about things change your mentality towards education uh, just because you cleared some papers or you have studied something does not mean anything it does not mean that you are entitled to clear the paper just because of practice a lot or are entitled to get a job or a certain pay that is how it does not work it just depends on what sort of value you can add so that's there i did hope uh, you know you all found this video useful and again in case you find any sort of calculation errors or any sort of uh, solution which you feel is might not be the correct way feel free to let us know through comment section thank you everyone